my name is Rob. Glad to be with you here tonight. We're kind of in the middle of this series right now called The Spoken Word, and we've had a couple of cool weeks going on the past couple of weeks. I opened us up with studying Jonah, and last week Andre did a little section on Isaiah, and really what we're doing right now is reading some Old Testament prophets with a New Testament lens, where we're seeing how this applies to us today, how God's word that was written literally thousands of years ago is still relevant to where we are today, and, and again, reading it with the hope and the lens of the New Testament that is Jesus. So all these things that we're reading right now are either pointing us towards our need for Jesus or pointing us towards the hope that we now have in Jesus. So that's what we're going to continue to do tonight. The staff here at Sanctuary has challenged me to do another minor prophet. And I'm not going to lie, this is, this is some pretty, it was some tough stuff, to be completely honest with you. So we're going to do Zephaniah tonight. Uh, some of you might not have even heard of Zephaniah. He's, he's this obscure minor prophet towards the end of the Old Testament. And we're going to jump into his story in just a little bit. But before I jump into the word, I'm going to pray over us and pray over me. I, I'm, I'm going to be selfish and pray over me too because, listen, I need prayer. And you can shoot some prayers my way right now as well. So, Lord, we, uh, we just invite you into this place that you're already here. You never left. God, you, you are with us, you are for us, you are not against us. We thank you that even when our eyes can't see, we will trust the voice that speaks, your voice, God, that's speaking over each and every one of us, into our situations, into our lives right now, into whatever circumstance. God, I pray that right now, as uh, I share this word that you've placed on my heart, Father, I like the prayer that I prayed last time, that you will take this one message and divide it into hundreds of different ways so it can speak to each and every person in this room individually, uniquely. However, you know their situation, I don't, God. So I pray that you will just speak to them in your divine way. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. I'm going to bring you back to a place that some of you are in right now. I was a broke college student about halfway through college. Let's be honest, I was a broke college student day one of college. Still am. And I'm a, I'm a few years graduated. So I didn't have a car the first two years that I was in college. It was fine. I lived in a city in South Florida. Uh, the weather was delightful in South Florida, maybe about as humid as it is this week, so not always delightful, but pretty humid, pretty hot. You didn't have to worry about snow, so I would be able to walk year-round, or more accurately, longboard year-round to wherever I wanted to go to, but by junior year, I needed to have a car to get me from point A to point B, and so on and so forth. So I get this car beginning of my junior year, I had also just come back from summer break from my sophomore year. Hannah and I had just begun dating that spring. It was my first time seeing her back, and I have this, this new car. I, actually, that's, it was new for me. It was not a new car. It was, get this, a 1999 Honda Accord. Man, it was the hottest wheels on campus. That thing was reliable. That thing was $1,200. So it was, it was the best car for me at that time. And I'm going to pick up my then, at the time, girlfriend, Hannah, from her apartment. And I pick her up. I, I can't even remember where we were going. Maybe we were going, I don't know, if we were going on a date somewhere. Let's pretend that we were being spiritual and we were going to church. So we were going to church, and I'm picking up Hannah from her apartment, and shortly after she gets in the car, you know, I, I had, this car was souped up, and by souped up, I mean the radio system was stock. However, I had this cassette tape. Some of you in this room don't even know what CDs are. A cassette tape is even more historic. So there, I, it was this cassette tape 
that converted, and there was an aux cable that came out, so I can play the latest music on my iPod Nano. It was so sweet. So I'm picking up my girlfriend Hannah in this 1999 Honda Accord with music bumping in my car, and all of a sudden we're, we're driving, and we're, we're on the road, and I, and I start hearing this clack, 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 clack. And as I accelerated, it would get faster. Clack, 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 clack. So I'm just kind of like trying to keep it cool. I, I got this car. I, I have my girlfriend in the car next to me. I'm pretending like I know what's actually going on. And, and so I'm just like trying to play it off like everything's cool and I don't even know what's going on. So I'm going in. He's like, do, do you hear that? Do you hear some noise? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I, it was one of those like cheesy little grins that I gave him, like, and I slightly like turn up the music a little bit more to drown out the clacking. I mean, clack, 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 and we're on the highway, and it's just like clacking so fast. Like, what is going on? So I'm thinking, man, this was a, again, it, I got it for twelve hundred dollars. It's got one hundred thirty-three thousand miles on it. I don't know what's going on. It, is it the engine? Is it? Is it the rotor? Is it the, I, I don't know, I, all these car terms. I should have Treadwell up here giving all the diagnosis or Josh Russo of what could have happened, what could have been going on in my car at that time. And we, we pull into, let's say we were pulling into the church, and somebody points out that in my tire, there was a screw about this size in my tire, big old screw. You see, they were doing construction by Hannah's apartment, so I ran over a screw without even noticing, and my, my tire wasn't, it wasn't flat. It was becoming more and more flat, and it was, it was very subtle. It, it was the subtlest little You know, there, there wasn't this huge tire blowout like I thought what would have happened with a screw that size. It was just a subtle little So it, it was, the air was letting out really slow. I got Hannah to point A, but I was like, if I don't fix this screw now, I don't know if I could get us back to point B. So we ended up bringing the car, got it fixed, and my tire was fine. The end. That's my story for today. What does that have to do with anything? Who invited this guy on stage? That's not about Jesus. That's about a tire. It's about a car. He sure talks about cars a lot. What's going on? He's got to come up with different analogies. I agree. So we're going to jump into the text and find out how this story fits in to Zephaniah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible or a Bible app on your phone, it, the, it's going to be on a Bible on the air, the Bible of the air up there. You can check it out. Read along with me. Here we go, Zephaniah. I'm glad you're in a good mood tonight. Zephaniah chapter 3, because it gets heavy, but then it gets light. I promise. Stick with me. This is not a message that you leave halfway through. No use in the bathroom right now. Stick with me this entire message. I don't care where you got to be. You're here right now. Stay with me, okay? Please, I promise. You're going to stay with me? Here we go. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 1. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem? We're starting off on a good note. <laughs> this city of violence and crime. No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Here's some hope right here. But the Lord is still there in this city. And he does no wrong. Day by day, he hands down justice and he does not fail. Moving ahead to verse 8. It says, therefore... Be patient, says the Lord. Gets really poetic. Stick with me. Again, stay with me. Soon I will stand and accuse these evil nations, for I have decided to gather the kingdoms of the earth and pour out my fiercest anger and fury on them. Whoa. All the earth will be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. Wow. That's hot. Literally. Next verse. Then, then, what's the fire for? I will purify the speech of all people. 
so that everyone can worship the Lord together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, shout out to the Ethiopians in the room, will come to present their offerings. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed, for you will no longer be rebels against me. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. Amen. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. That's a fun word. Those who are left will be the lowly and humble, for it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will never tell lies or deceive one another. They will eat and sleep in safety, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, or you can insert your name there. Sing, whatever your name is. Shout aloud, O Israel, insert your name again. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem, for the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion. Cheer up. Insert your name. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Wow. This seems like a strange turn of events from where we started. We start off with sorrow awaiting rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime. You know, Jerusalem was not supposed to be known as a city of violence and crime. It was the capital of Israel, which was essentially the, the headquarters for God's people, the headquarters for the people that should be promoting Jesus, God, the best. And he's like, Jerusalem, you are, you are supposed to be like me. You are supposed to be my representation here on earth, but you, you are so far from me right now. You, you, like, I don't even know who you are. Like, you don't remind me of me at all. I don't, I don't know what you remind me of. You're, you're full of violence and crime. And, and there's some other things that God is saying is going on with, with Israel that we're going to dive into in just a little bit. But here's the big thing from Zephaniah is there's this side of God there, there, I shouldn't say that there's two sides of God. There's one full picture of God that's going on here. A God that does not tolerate sin, but also wants the absolute best for us. And in that absolute best, he loves us like crazy and unconditionally and radically. And, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more right now. So God loves us too much to tolerate sin. And here's the thing is that not all sins, to go back to a tire analogy, not all sins are going to be like blowout sins in your life. As a matter of fact, most of them are not going to be blowout sins. But here's what happens if we are unaware, if we won't stay woke to what's going on and who's speaking into our heads and what's coming out of our hands, is, is that habitual sin is a lot more like this. And it gets in... And it might not be this huge pop. It might be a little bit more like sin. It, it, it might happen subtly. It might happen slowly. But all of a sudden, over time, you let that habitual sin, sin stay in your tire, and you're going to be going flat, 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 and you will not be able to get anywhere. You're going you're gonna to slow down. You're going to not be able to take your girlfriend to where she needs to go. You're going to be stuck. So what God is saying is, Israel, Jerusalem, you have let too many screws into your tires, and you haven't done anything about it. I've been pointing these things out to you, but, but something needs to change here. Something needs to happen, and it points to our need for Jesus, it, it, it points to our need for someone to take the screws out of our tires and put them in his wrists and said, and that's what Jesus did. That's what happens here. This is what Zephaniah is setting us up for. So when Jesus comes, when we evaluate the life of Jesus, when we evaluate his death and his resurrection, there are two things that I want to grab from Jesus' life or let go of and grab onto. 
First thing is, if Jesus died for it, I don't want it. If Jesus died for it, I don't want it. And you might be thinking in your seats right now, well, well, Jesus died for me. He did die for you, but more specifically, he died for the sin that had you stuck. He died for the sin that was in our lives. And, and, and if you've breathed before, you've been in this position. If you've ever taken a breath before, you've been in this position. So Jesus died for sin. So what happens then to Christians are two things that I noticed. The world is wondering what makes us different from everyone else. Because honestly, I have some non-Christian friends that are really good and really kind people. I have some non-Christian friends right now who are being extremely generous in the family situation, specifically for my brother. They don't even know him, and they're being generous, and they're being kind. And they don't even know Jesus. And, And the world is wondering, hey, what makes us Christians different from everyone else? And the response that happens to to Christians when it comes to this sin issue is that we either don't allow Jesus to transform our lives to become more and more like him. We we allow the screws to stay in our tires. Or, Or there are Christians that are pursuing holy lives while being jealous of people that are not. And this comes in a couple of different forms. I I had one person complain to me earlier on in in ministry. It was a a complaint or a uh, holy call out. I don't remember what they called it exactly. But it was someone that wanted to let me know that someone who was, if I might add, new to the sanctuary community was still sleeping around with her boyfriend. And, And I... The way, here's the thing, the way that this person was describing the event, I can tell from his tone, dude, you, are you jealous about that? Like, do you, do you wish that you can be doing that? It, because here's the thing, if, if Jesus died for it, I don't want it. If, if Jesus died for it, I don't want it. I don't want watered down sex. I want the real deal. I don't want to hold on to anger. Well, you, yeah, I'm not going to be jealous about that person that, that wants and desires vengeance over their enemy. I'm not, I'm not mad about the people. I don't want to be mad about the people that are mad or jealous about them. I don't want anxiety and worry to rule my decisions. I don't want my finances to control my life. If, if Jesus died for it, I don't want it. But there's a flip side to it. If Jesus came to life for it, I'll grab onto it. If Jesus came to life for it, I'll grab onto it. So what that looks like instead is I want to enjoy my relationships with God and with people. I want to throw the best parties on the block. I want to have the wildest adventures with my, with my wife. And you can let your mind go to all stretches of the imagination of what that might look like. I want to be able to smother people with love, even though they might try to strangle me with hate. I don't want... Oh, man. I want to have self-control over my emotions and not let my feelings control me. If Jesus came to life for these things, I want to grab a hold of these things. I want to enjoy this life. As he says in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. Grab hold of that is what God's saying here. And that leads us to the next point. God loves us too much to let us pursue what isn't best for us. So in verse 8, there's this, like, this weird thing that happens. It, it's this really, again, it's this poetic kind of, your, your translation might say the, the indignation of God, the, the fire of God, whatever it might be. And I always read this as like, man, God just wants to take us all out. He is mad. Jesus, what is going on? Like, Jesus, you seem completely different from your father that I read in the Old Testament here. What? What's happening here? But, but this fire that is being talked about is not to destroy, it's to purify. God's fire doesn't destroy, it purifies. So, and we see this in the next verse. In, in verse 9, it says, Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. I need a wedding band. Does anyone have a wedding band in this room? What's that? It's stretchy? All right, that won't work. I'm sorry. Here we go. Wedding band right here. Thank you. I'm going to keep this. I'm kidding. It's my mom's. 
It's my mom. So we have a, we have a wedding band right here. Is this white gold? It, it's very pretty. Wow, I've never seen this, Mom. It's very nice. <laughs> you want to see it? Want to check it out? It, it's, it's a real deal. This is a white gold wedding band that I have in my hands right here. You want to see it, too? Here we go. I promise. I, I'm not making this up. So this ring was not found like this. The, no, nobody just stumbled upon this ring all of a sudden and was like, wow, that's going to fit my mom's hand really well. You know what had to happen? Somebody went out, found some gold in some dirt, put the gold through some fire, melted away the impurities that were in this ring, things like bronze and and zinc and copper were, were part of this gold ring at one point, and then it had to be shaped for the purpose of fitting my mom's hand. What God is saying here is that I need, I need to purify you so that you can fulfill your purpose. I need to purify you so you can fulfill your purpose. You see, we, we might have been found in, in all different shapes. We, we were probably, we, God found us in the dirt, just to be real with you all. God found us in the dirt. And what's happening here with Jerusalem, what's happening here with Israel, what, what Zephaniah is saying is, Israel, you're, you're settling for an iron ring when God's trying to give you the gold. You're settling for the bronze when God is trying to give you the gold. You are holding on to these things that are cheaper than the real deal, that are cheaper than the best. And I need to purify you so you can become who I've wanted you to be. Here, you can have this back. I don't want to forget it. This is important. Boom, wedding ring. So how does God do that for us now? Well, in the New Testament, again, we're reading this Old Testament passage with New Testament eyes. God has given us his spirit to become more and more like him. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God, the Holy Spirit, transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here's what else we know from the book of Romans is that God has not given us a spirit of condemnation, but he's given us the Holy Spirit to convict us. There's a really big difference between the two, a really really big difference between condemnation and conviction that we need to settle tonight because both might make you feel bad at one point. I don't want you to think, oh man, I got bad vibes going on right now. I think that that's something that people are saying these days. Good vibes only. I want good vibes only. Well, sometimes bad vibes happen so that you can have better vibes later because here, here's what happens. Here's what happens. God does not give us a spirit to condemn us. He gives us a spirit to convict us. So this is what it looks like. A condemning spirit will say, well, I got to screw my tire. That's just how it is. I feel really bad about this. That's just life. That's just bad about how, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I got I to gotta screw, I can't, I can't change, I can't do anything. It, a condemning spirit makes you feel bad, but ultimately it, you wallow in, in this guilt for so long that nothing ever changes. Conviction is the other way. Conviction is, hey, there's a screw in your tire, but we're gonna fix it. it the Holy Spirit says, hey, there's something going on in your life right now. There, there's a screw in your tire, and it might be a little bit painful to pull it out, but we're gonna fix it. it you, you see, a spirit of condemnation keeps you stuck, while a spirit of conviction helps you move forward. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in us and for us. And now, here's the other question is, what does the Spirit convict us of? What does the Spirit convict us of? I, it, it, was, it was subtle. I don't know if you caught it. But verse 2 actually says what God is peeved about. Verse 2 says, no one can tell it anything. He's talking about God's people right now. In other words, he's saying, nobody's obeying. He refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. There's kind of a progression here of God becoming more and more hurt. He's like, there's no obedience. There's, there's no listening to, to my correction. There's no trust in me and who I am. And then here's the part that breaks God's heart the most. 
as he says, they won't draw near to me. God's saying they won't draw near to me. What? Why won't they draw near to me? So the Spirit is going to convict us of these things. The Spirit convicts us of these things. If you're not obeying God, the Spirit is going to convict you of your disobedience. If you're not listening to correction in your life, helpful correction, not just criticism from people, big difference. If you're not listening to correction, God's going to convict you of that. If, if you're not trusting in God, oof, this is a big one. If you're not trusting in God, he's going to convict you of that. And, and the biggest thing is if, if you're not wanting to draw near to God as he's drawing near to you, he's going to say, hey, what's going on? That, that's not like us. We, we got some history here. So here's, here's just two simple statements. Two simple statements that we're going to make together tonight in light of this text. First is, I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay humble. Zephaniah 3, verses 11 through 12, reverses verse 2. So these next two points are going to completely reverse what I just said. So instead of people that are being disobedient, instead of people that are being stubborn and not teachable, God says this instead, on that day you will no longer need to be ashamed for you no longer be rebels against me. No longer rebels means, hey, we're obeying God now. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. No more pride. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. Again, no pride. There's humility. Those who are left will be the lowly and the humble, for it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. So I'm going to stay humble in my obedience. I'm going to stay humble in my obedience to what God has for me. I'm going to stay humble in my obedience to trust that God's ways are higher than my ways. So God, it doesn't make sense what you're calling me to do right now. It might not feel right, but I'm going to put my feelings aside for a second and instead trust that you are right, that you do have the best for me. God, I'm going to trust that you are good even though this situation is not. I'm going to trust God and obey you regardless of what I'm going through right now. I'm going to stay humble in my obedience. I'm going to stay humble in my obedience. The next thing that I'm going to stay humble in is in my learner's posture. My learner's posture. That, that's one of the core values here at Sanctuary, by the way, is, is remaining humble and teachable and in a learner's posture. Hey, I might have graduated from college, but I'm still learning each and every day. I might, have, I might have graduated with a degree. You might have graduated with a degree. You probably have even more degrees than me. But you will never graduate from learning if you are a Christian. And what, what gets God so heartbroken here is that he has these people that are all for him, apparently. And they're not remaining teachable. They're, they're stubborn. They're, they're, they're just in one ear and not even out the other. It's, it's hardly even coming in this year. They got wax or something blocking what God is trying to say. They're not listening to what he is saying, so I'm going to remain humble in my teachable spirit. You know, to, to make this a little bit more personal, this past week, I was talking with Josh Fay, who's my boss. Some of you might know him. And Josh and I were talking, we were um, actually talking about something that we do as a staff here at Sanctuary. We, we meet during the week, and at one point, we talk about all different things that happen, especially on a Sunday night or like a midweek, our, our big services, if you will. And we chat through, hey, what were some wins? What were, what were the success stories? And then what were the areas of growth for each and every one of us? The, the areas of growth is a really fun way of saying, what can we do better? What can we do better? How can we improve? How can we remain teachable and humble? We're, we're looking to get better in each and everything that we do. And I'm going to be real with you. So we're, we're talking, and actually it was this past week that... I was, we were talking, and we were giving Andre some feedback from last week, and he did amazing. Andre seriously did amazing. I'm so proud of him. But then I, so I, I gave Andre all the successes, but then I also at the same time gave him, hey, this is where you can grow in. These are some things that I noticed, so we're, we're next time you can, you can grow in this area. And, and I'm talking with Josh, and I'm like, yo, Josh, Andre is so like me, it is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Like, if, if you are anything like Andre and me, and I'm sorry, I didn't ask for your permission to talk about this, 
and you're anything like Andre and me, sometimes you, you take criticism or feedback as a personal attack instead of someone personally investing in you. So, so I, I would, especially as I was starting off in this position up here, Josh would give me this feedback because Josh is really good at giving feedback. It's part of his strengths. And Josh would be like, you need to stop preaching like three sermons in one message. <laughs> Still working on that. He was like, you need to have shorter intro stories. Still working on that. And he would, he would go through all these different things, and I would leave the meeting being like, yeah, I want your feedback, but honestly, I would leave the meeting feeling deflated, flatter than my tire. And I was talking with Josh this week, and I was like, Josh, as I'm studying the text for this week, I just had this huge, like, aha moment of like, Josh, you're not, you were never saying these things to, to hurt me. It, it's saying that you were personally invested in me and that you're, you're trusting me, and that you're giving me this feedback because you're going to trust me to step into this position again, if not even something greater. And I said, you know what, Josh? I would be more worried if you stopped giving me feedback. If you stop giving me feedback, that means that there might be someone coming in for my job right behind me, and I don't even know it. What, what feedback is God giving you in your life right now? How are you remaining teachable to becoming more and more like him? Are, are you shutting him out? Or are you going to say, God is, God is convicting me right now to move into this because he is personally invested in me. Jesus loves me. He wants, again, the best for me. So he's giving me this feedback that hurts a little bit now. But man, I'm going to step into that so that next time that God trusts me with another position, next time that God trusts me with fill in the blank, I'm going to crush it even harder next time. Hey, Ben, you guys can come back up, by the way. I'm going to stay hungry, too. Did I already say this? Did I already say this? I'm going to stay hungry. I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay hungry. I'm going to stay hungry. Humble, I'm going to stay hungry. Here's how I'm going to stay hungry. I'm going to stay hungry in my trust of who God is. I'm going to stay hungry in my trust of who God is. What the heck does that mean? I'll get there. I'm going to stay hungry in, who my trust, in, in my trust of who God is. So you know what God convicted me of this week as I'm reading this? Is ask God for opportunities to increase my trust in who he is instead of looking for the bare minimum I can trust him with. This was heavy. I'm, I'm going to ask for God. God, give me more opportunities to trust you even more. I want to stay hungry in my trust, in my faith, in who you are. I want to I stay hungry for that. God, I want to I keep our faith fresh. I want to throw some more fuel on this fire because here's what happens is I can be a Christian for 25 years. And if I'm not growing in my faith, that fire starts to sizzle a little bit. And guess what? That's not on him. That's on me. That's not on him. That's on me. That God is always going to say yes to prayers like, God, give me opportunities to love people today. God, give me opportunities to share your grace with someone today. God, give me opportunities to be generous with an unexpected stranger today. God is just waiting to say yes, access granted to those prayers. He's waiting to say yes to God, increase my trust in you. Because here's the deal. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 makes for a really inspiring Instagram bio, but a really interesting reality. It does. And it's so tough of, again, how I evaluate my own life and how I, I trust God with, with, I'm like, I'm just trying to get by today, God. God, I'm not even thinking about finances for the future right now, that 401k, that. Roth IRA, 403b, what's up, guys? There you go, stock options, everything. I'm not even worried about that, God. I'm looking for how am I going to pay the bills this week? Can I trust you? 
more than just for today. God, can I, can I trust you with my whole heart? Trust the Lord with all of my heart. God, because I'm going to be honest, I don't trust you fully sometimes. I don't... I'm kind of like these Israelites sometimes where it's like, yeah, we follow God, but I have this side chick and my trust in other places too. Yeah, I'm going to follow God, but... Yeah, I'm going to trust God, but... God's like, trust me. Trust where we're going. Trust what I have for you. So I'm going to remain hungry. I'm going to stay hungry in my trust of who God is. And here's the other thing. I'm going to stay hungry in my desire to be close to God. I'm going to stay hungry in my desire to be near to his heart. Listen to these beautiful verses in verses 16 through 17. It says, on the, on the day the announcement to Jerusalem will be, this is for you. Cheer up. <laughs> Don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. The Lord your God is in you. We read this with New Testament lens again. The Lord your God is with you. He is for you. He is among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. Guess what? God's not angry at you. He is delighted in you. He's glad. He smiles when he thinks about you. He's not upset. He's not silent. He's, as we go to read, he's not silent. He's singing. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. How beautiful is this in the earlier verses? We got Jerusalem that's singing. <laughs> and God's like, you're so beautiful, my people. You're so beautiful, my child. <laughs> I can't help but burst in song myself. I'm so stoked. <laughs> This is the God who loves you. <laughs> this is so beautiful. What a duet. Go ahead. You can name any duet. I bet this one is better. The songs of the church and the songs of God coming together. In beautiful poetry. God has beautiful poetry for you. God has written beautiful songs for us. The Bible says his bride, the church. This is who God is. Will you stand with me, please? <laughs> I'm just preaching like it's the last time I'm going to have this platform. And it's to tell you that whatever you're pursuing right now, are you pursuing it with the purposes of God? Wherever your heart is right now, however many screws you have in your tire, will you trust that God is going to take them? He's already taken them. That God is closer than you think. You know, what would it look like, church, if we would quit having sin as a side chick and instead grabbed a hold of God's best for us? What kind of church can we be if we remained humble in posture and hungry in attitude? What would we look like? What would our towns look like? What would our schools look like? What would our workplaces look like? What would our families look like? We remain humble in position, in hungry, in attitude. This is what God has called us to. But there's one thing in this. It, it's so clear in here. There's one thing that is the most important thing on God's heart. And it is that you are near to him. It is that he has the opportunity to be near to you. Revelation 3, it says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. God is knocking on some doors tonight saying, hey, will you let me in? 
I'm here. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for this adventure. I'm waiting for this ride. We got something great in store. Will you let me in? So I'm going to pray over us right now. And some of you had not had the opportunity to place your personal trust in Jesus yet. And I'm saying tonight is a night. Wait no longer. Wait no longer. He's available for you now in his fullness. Everything that he has, yours. So Jesus, I pray right now for the person, for the people in this room that you are just moving in their midst tonight, God, that they are realizing their, their need and their need for you and your love for them. If that is you tonight, if you have not made that decision yet to place your trust and hope in Jesus, will you just confidently raise your hand in the midst of people that are going to celebrate and cheer you on? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, he's here, he's ready, he's available, he's for you. That's so good. Will we all just repeat this prayer together? Jesus, I need you. I want you. I trust you with all that I am. You are Lord of my life, the lover of my soul. And God, I pray that right now as I sing, that these words, that these songs will become truth and reality in my life. You don't have to repeat that. You can repeat that in your heart. That's what he's going to do right now. So God, we, we ask you to have your way. You're invited here. You're wanted here. And we're going to lift up one huge shout of praise right now before we enter back into some song because many people in the room tonight just gave their life to Jesus for the very first time. Shout it like you mean it. Let's worship him.